Okay, so um, <clears throat> theta oscillations. <laughs> so I've been talking about it a bit already in the talk. <laughs> Um, so for this part, uh, as I said, I was hoping to be a bit more interactive. Um, so the general structure uh, of the talk would be to first tell you about where oscillations come from and what are the properties of theta oscillations, how are they involved in learning and the evidence we have mostly from animal and adult literature. Then an overview of studies measuring theta in infants and children, specifically in active learning paradigms or learning paradigms in general. And then finally, some guidelines on experimental design involving theta oscillations. And like I said, um, if you are willing to be recorded, uh, please do raise questions, comments, or discussion at any point during the workshop. I was hoping it to be less of a lecture, but more of a discussion. Also, if you know um, or have conducted studies using this measure that I don't know about or haven't mentioned, please do bring it up. If you're planning to uh, um, design experiments that would look at theta oscillations, please bring it up so we can discuss um, how to do this. Okay. Oops. So rhythmic activity in the brain. So oscillations, so rhythms in the brain are formed by very populations of neurons that fire together and are inhibited together as a result of collective activity of excitatory and inhibitory interneurons. And the speed of oscillations or the wavelength of the rhythm determines the temporal windows of processing as well as the size of neurons that are involved in the um, activation. So as such rhythms basically enable neurons to fire in synchrony, both locally and also to coordinate multiple areas into large scale brain networks through phase synchrony. And we have rhythms at different frequencies. So the frequency we're talking about today is theta range, which spans roughly three to five in infants, four to eight in adults. But we have other frequencies as well, the lowest one being delta, then alpha, beta, gamma, and so on. And slow oscillators such as theta, so this is sort of the second to slowest rhythm that we, we know, um, is particularly <clears throat> responsible for facilitating um, many neurons in large brain areas and therefore um, conducive for information transfer between different structures of the brain as opposed to local integration which we know is done by higher frequency oscillators such as gamma activity. Theta oscillations were first reported as the most dominant rhythm in the hippocampus of rodents. And subsequently using intracranial EEG, MEG, and scalp EEG recordings, these oscillations in humans have been recorded primarily over the frontal lobes, but also medial temporal lobes, uh, and amygdala and hippocampus intracranially. <clears throat> As I said, they span about four to eight hertz in adults and three to six hertz in infants. Uh, but note that these frequency ranges differ between the two populations due to developmental changes but both note what has been functionally identified as theta oscillations in each population. So even though they differ in frequency, they're functionally considered identical. And crucially, theta reasons in humans seem not to be only present in isolated areas of the brain, but as I've said before, proposed to function mainly as the rhythm enabling interaction and transmission of information between cortices and between cortices and hippocampus specifically. And the uh, cognitive function most extensively related to theta rhythms is, and the evidence both on the level of single cell recordings as well as, as well as measured by behavioral performance of various cognitive tasks is the process of information encoding and memory formation. That is theta, theta rhythms are considered to be associated with learning. 
And memory formation is thought to result from the modification of synapses and neuronal circuits through long-term potentiation. This is a lasting enhancement of synaptic potentials resulting from repetitive stimulation. And while LTP has been demonstrated in several brain regions, it is most robust and therefore most documented in studies investigating the hippocampus. Um, and critically, the induction of this plasticity, so long-term potentiation, is favored by coordinated action potential timing across populations of neurons. And in particular, it has been shown repeatedly that it's trains of stimuli delivered at intervals equal to theta frequencies that are found to more readily induce long-term potentiation than similar stimulation at other frequencies. And therefore, um, inducing theta oscillations during encoding can directly affect the changes in synaptic plasticity. In other words, theta activity can directly um, modulate memory formation. <clears throat> So the evidence that we have for this causal role of theta in learning mostly come from animal research, or at least the beginnings of it that do. In addition to single cell levels, uh, where we show the increased long-term potentiation, uh, animal research has provided numerous studies showing hippocampal theta also affects learning as measured by behavioral tasks. For example, hippocampal theta is um, positively correlated with performance of Romans in a maze task and differentiated between correctly and incorrectly remembered odors in a recognition memory task. Critically, like on single synapse LTP level, a causal role for theta in learning has been demonstrated on behavioral level using interventions. Um, administering lesions to the septum, which disrupts the pacemaker for theta, or from logically blocking uh, theta result in impaired or slowed acquisition rate on classic conditional paradigms. Um, and in contrast, pharmacologically enhancing theta rhythms, which you can do by blocking serotonin, results in better performance in similar tasks. And the same effect on learning was achieved when hippocampal theta was activ activity was artificially enhanced by electrical stimulation. And when measuring spontaneous theta activity online and administering training either contingent on episodes of increased hy hippocampal theta or hippocampal non-theta states, theta oscillations during training were found to boost the learning outcome, whereas their absence had a detrimental effect. <clears throat> and furthermore, even sort of baseline resting state theta differences between individuals can differentiate um, basically whether individual rodents were successfully, um, how fast and how successful they were at completing maze tasks. So um, this was recorded again in the hippocampus prior to conditioning and the amount of theta before training predicted whether or not, uh, or how well the animals would learn the new activity. In humans, studies investigating the role of theta in, in processes of encoding have relied la largely on EEG measures recorded on the scalp. The relationship between scalp recorded theta um, and encoding was first demonstrated in the areas of studies by Klimesh. Um, for example, in study of sort of incidental learning, authors found that the items that were later remembered were associated with larger theta synchronization during encoding than items that were forgotten. And um, studies such as Guderian using MEG um, demonstrated that theta activity in the medial temporal lobe um, demonstrated a strong predictive relationship between theta power shortly preceding the stimuli onset and later recall of the stimuli. Uh, research also provided evidence on the origin of the scalp recorded theta oscillations by recording encoding predictive theta intracranially. So these were patients that had implants in the brain that allowed for um, intracranial recordings while they were learning on tasks. And recordings from single neurons in hippocampus and amygdala while participants were learning new stimuli demonstrated that as in animals, the accuracy of phase locking of the neurons to the theta rhythm during encoding predicted both whether the stimuli would be rec uh, recalled or forgotten, as well as the 
subjective strength of memory as reported by the participants. Um, and although these loops, these relations are not conclusive in, in humans, um, the research investigating the effect of theta activity on encoding that we see on scalp and intracranial AVG parallels the well-established findings in animal research and supports the thesis that theta rhythms may induce synaptic plasticity in the human brain as it does in rodents. <clears throat> Therefore, the link between cortically recorded theta power and encoding of new information in humans can be assumed to result from theta activity that is induced into cortex via cortical hippocampal loops. And finally, um, the kind of intervention studies that can be done with human adults using TMS likewise confirmed that um, applying brain stimulation that induces or enhances the amount of theta <clears throat> activity improves encoding of hippocampal dependent memories when applied during learning. But uh, the aim of this talk and workshop is to discuss how theta oscillations may be used in the investigation of active learning. So to specifically more focus on the active paradigms, we need to see evidence whether this rhythm is involved beyond the single uh, cell recordings and incidental learning. So now I turn to the research that suggests that theta oscillations may reflect active cognitive engagement, and this rhythm seems to be connected to the reward system of the brain, which is relevant for the kind of intrinsically motivated learning that we are interested in. <clears throat> so as I've already mentioned in the talk, there are several studies in which human adults were tasked with remembering a list of items, and when they were able to predict when the items would be presented, we can see an increase in theta activity in anticipation of stimulus presentation. And this theta activity in anticipation, again, predicted successful encoding. And the fact that we can see activity even before encoding actually happens has led several authors <clears throat> to interpret this activity as indexing some sort of active control of attention or cognitive effort so the control for selective encoding or some uh, termed it intentional activation of mnemonic context in which the subsequently presented item can be embedded. Uh, in our case, observing an increase in theta activity prior to learning strongly suggests that theta is not only involved in incidental learning, but appears to be an active cognitive engagement and it perhaps reflecting an intent to encode. And moreover, when in these tasks, adults are promised either high or low monetary rewards, for example, for remembering items, a strong predictive relationship is found between the power of pre-stimulus theta activity and the subsequent memory performance, but importantly, only when learning takes place in the prospect of high reward. So reward anticipation facilitates memory encoding, and this is suggested to happen by inducing theta oscillatory activity before an event is perceived, providing a link between theta effects of memory formation and theta in response to reward expectation found in animal research. And moreover, like the neural activation measured in states of curiosity using fMRI, theta oscillations induced by external or internal reward were partly localized to the reward security of the brain. Like the curiosity induced neural activity, Theta was proposed to modulate the effect of the dopaminergic system on hippocampal activity and through that influencing memory formation. So there appears to be a strong association between reward processing, be, be it external monetary rewards that are manipulated in experimental paradigms or intrinsic curiosity, for example, and theta and memory enhancement. And the link seems to be the dopaminergic system um, which is modulated by theta and the reward, and which in turn affects the hippocampal activity and memory formation. And although the direction and the exact relationships between these um, oscillations and motivation and encoding are still not fully understood, the evidence that links these processes is um, pretty convincing in that uh, we can grant the interpretation of significant scalp recorded oscillations in theta frequencies 
where someone can predict when the information will be provided as reflecting either extrins extrinsically or intrinsically motivated preparation for information encoding. Okay, so that's the evidence we have from animal and adult research, which is pretty extensive and this was not an exhaustive um, summary at all. Um, oops, sorry. Um, but now I turn to the population that we're almost interested in, which is infants and children. And uh, so the reason why I started looking at theta to start with is because the benefits of having a neural marker that could elucidate mechanisms of learning and motiva especially motivational aspects of learning without relying on behavioral expressions or self-report is arguably most obvious uh, when you're dealing with populations that are non-verbal, such as infants. <clears throat> so in this section, I will review a selection of studies that have measured theta activity in various contexts of infant learning, um, as well as children learning in some cases. And then I move on to some more practical considerations for experimental design using theta as a measure. Okay. So one of the obvious, although, perhaps poorly defined elements of active learning is sustained attention. And sustained attention is neural and opinions in infants was first investigated by Elena Rekova. In their study, the activity was recorded in eight to 11 month old infants under conditions that they termed internally ex or externally controlled attention and a baseline condition. So I believe the externally controlled was watching soap bubbles and internally control was um, exploring objects. So not exactly uh, well-matched uh, conditions, but nonetheless, they found higher uh, power theta oscillations during internally controlled attention compared to other conditions, predominantly over the frontal and temporal record recording sites. And importantly, the power of frontal theta activity was shown to correlate with um, the abilities to sustain attention in eight mentals. In a more recent and more detailed analysis of neural activity and visual attention um, during free play with objects, Sam Was and colleagues have found that the theta power pre preceding each visual fixation was shown to positively predict the duration of that fixation. Um, but it did so only when infants were playing with objects on their own and not when their visual attention was guided by an adult partner. So they had two conditions, um, one in which an infant was interacting with an adult and one when they were playing on their own. So this suggests that theta activity can offer us insights into infants' intrinsically guided attention beyond its behavioral manifestations. Because interestingly, in, if I correct me if I'm wrong, Sam, if you're still here, but I believe that um, the bouts of attention were in fact longer when the infant was interacting with an adult but um, the theta activity was lower. So it seems that this measure can offer either complementary or perhaps uh, measures that go beyond the behavioral manifestations of infant attention and can also enable us to study how external factors such as social interactions influence these processes. And beyond mere measure of duration of attention, a crucial aspect of active learning is also directing attention to the relevant information in the environment. Um, and uh, this was investigated in a study looking at perceptual narrowing. Um, so what I don't think the theta was in fact the main measure of interest here, but what they did find is that uh, when they showed, um, not showed, uh, it was auditory stimuli of syllables either in a participant's native or foreign language, which also were, had a frequency modulation. So some of them were frequent and other ones were sort of oddball. And um, what they found was that six month olds um, indiscriminately paid attention more to the frequent syllables regardless of the language they were listening to. So this is in the period where presumably they're still sensitive to sounds from all languages. Uh, in contrast, 12 month olds showed most theta to syllables of their native language, which presumably reflects the fact that they're learning 
their language, whereas adults showed mostly the poor foreign um, language, again, suggesting that since they're expert users of their own language, they attend to ones that they are not familiar with. So they conclude that theta in this case reflects individual's allocation of attention or investment of cognitive effort into stimuli that is most relevant for their um, individual learning experience. Sorry, Katharina, could I interrupt here? Please. Um, I'm just wondering about this whole, this is something that I've been thinking about all through your first talk as well, about this relationship between theta, attention, and learning. Um, is there any suggestion that theta uh, is somehow reflective of improved or different encoding, or is it just a process? Is it just something attention mediated? Would you see it as being anything more than just attention mediation? <laughs> I mean, my response to that is what is attention? I I don't know, like these are terms that we use as if um, they are somehow well specified in the brain, but actually we could define attention by, by theta, or we could define attention by visual attention. Mm -hmm. If we define attention by something that facilitates learning, then we have some evidence that in fact, um, theta is a better predictor of learning than visual attention. So, yeah, it depends on how you define attention, how you measure it, and... Yeah, and so I guess the question then is, uh, should we be looking at the relationship between theta and learning at all, or is it just theta and attention that we're talking about all the time? Because no, think... like the attention needs to come in before the learning comes in, right? So what if all that theta is indexing is increased attention during when you are given more information? And that impacts encoding processes, but it's sort of a, an indirect stage of encoding or learning that we're talking about. I mean, I don't know what is the evidence that attention itself drives learning. Well, you have to actually get to the information before you can learn something, right? Even peripheral attention is attention. So, so my- Can we take part in the discussion? Sorry? Can we take part? Yes, please. But go ahead with what you want no, to No, 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 go, go, go. <laughs> no, I, was, I mean, I think there's, there's evidence and, and maybe others will talk about this in, in the same workshop that you could have the opposite uh, relation back to correlation, but where learning drives attention. And apart from the case in which indeed you have a sudden onset of a stimulus that, that grabs attention, you, you have the un orienting, uh, which where attention was there possibly before information processing. But I guess even in that sense, in that case, you have information processing before attention. So I think there are actually very few cases where I can think of where attention is there before some form of information processing, which to me is equal to learning. And I can think of all these examples that Katarina has on this uh, on this slide. I can think of them being driven by learning, actually, then not by attention. So even when you have these effects that seem to, to be anticipating something like <clears throat> theta before fixation, but we know that there is information processing before someone actually fixates, moves the eyes to a place. So there was uh, some information processing that, that uh, affected the decision process of moving your eyes to something because there's something interesting there to, to, to further process. So in that case, theta could already be indexing the beginning of information processing. I wouldn't mind theta. <laughs> Let's not say I wouldn't mind that, but I would, I don't, I'm not sure that I would equate information processing with learning for a start. Why I feel like learning has to be something more than just processing the information. It has to be encoded. Otherwise it's not learned. It's just on the moment information processing. It's only when you sort of encode it in the brain and can access it later that learning takes place, right? We have evidence that theta predicts learning. And we also have evidence that visual attention does not necessarily predict learning, right? So there's 
re, um, results in infants with habituation tasks and whatever that don't necessarily mean that if they dishabituate that they have learned something or that the more or the opposite right that the more visual attention doesn't necessarily reflect <clears throat> faster learning or better um, encoding so yeah so <laughs> yeah okay we'll, we'll we'll see where this leads takes us during the workshop no but i think these are all important questions that just i i often find that we it comes down to the terminology and the definitions of what we use um I personally find the data convincing on this rhythm being involved <clears throat> in actual encoding. And whether you term it attention or information processing or which leads which, and I agree that often attention can follow information processing, but where does learning come online? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Garrett? Yeah, hi. Um, hi. <laughs> hello. Um, I, I have a, a more general question. Um, maybe I missed that. But but comparing it with like ERP signals, um, because ERPs are often linked to a specific part of the brain or to the scalp. scalp. Um, so am I getting this right? That theta seems to be, it can occur anywhere, basically. but but. Are you saying that no matter where it occurs, it has this kind of common role, or could it not be that that you know a hippocampal theta is fundamentally different from a frontal cortex theta? Just wonder how how general you you understand the role of theta to be. Yeah, so I discussed some of the localization parts later on. Um, I don't think really even with any. EEG measure, we can make strong conclusions about where the signal originates from necessarily, right? Because where you detect it on the scalp is necessarily where it comes from. Um, but it is, and there's some consistency in where we record uh, or where we have effects in theta, which is mostly frontal, but the mm -hmm. adult literature with it using different measures shows these cortical hippocampal loops. And especially with the memory formation ones, it's specifically in the hippocampus. But um, yeah, in terms of localization and where it originates, uh, I would be very careful in concluding, uh, based especially in infant data, what the theta we are recording actually reflects, although there is some consistency with adult research that, I mean, we don't have any reason to think there are different processes, but we also don't have evidence that they are the same. I'm not sure I answered your question. Sorry. No, no, you did. Can I quickly ask a follow-on question, which which is kind of very mechanistic, um, because it kind of still boggles our mind to even imagine how they can, how, how synchronous oscillation can emerge across the brain. So is is the idea that there's some kind of common rhythm providing area that, that branches out to the areas that get synchronized or is the idea that um, synchronization kind of emerges in a self-organized way by, by by interaction between between two areas i believe it's both so from the sorry I'll just go back to the the animal research so here they did directly uh just check the right reference so that I don't get it wrong. Um, yeah, so when they administered lesions to the septum, <laughs> uh, which is apparently a pacemaker for the hippocampal theta rhythm in the rats, mm. um, that disrupted the synchronization and therefore disrupted the encoding. But a lot of oscillations as far as I understand, indeed actually emerge from sort of interactions between neurons that eventually um, basically interact with each influence each other until they okay. become mm -hmm. a synchronous movement. Um, exactly how it works, I honestly don't know. Um, there's an amazing book, uh, if anyone's interested to dig it deeper into this, called Rhythm of the Brain by Bujaki. Um, and it's it's really well written and easy to digest, but um, it's been a while, so I wouldn't be comfortable <laughs> summarizing how exactly it happens. 
Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, shall I move on? Are there more comments or questions? And there are some comments on the chat. Uh -huh. yeah. Let me check that. Seems evidence showed is suggesting theta involves in learning throughout anticipation, readiness before learning, actual coding, and memory formation. Is that a question? Yeah, I, it does seem so. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think the main uh, role is actually encoding, but if you know that information that you are motivated to learn will be presented, then these rhythms might be engaged even in anticipation. Um, it's also been shown in retrieval of, of memories. So uh, when they measured theta during recall, they also have stronger theta during uh, before recalling items that were correctly recalled as opposed to ones that were incorrectly. So yeah, it seems to be um, an encoding, retrieval, and anticipation <laughs> rhythm, um, which also in a way makes sense when you retrieve a memory that you reactivate the same processes, um, but yeah. Then another comment may be interesting in relation to discussion on the source of theta and its role. Okay, so this is a, a paper. Thank you for the reference. I'll check it out later. Anticipatory theta in animals. Um, I don't know of any paradigms that directly um, looked at it. There are only the ones where um, it was more like resting state theta, but, which predicted performance, but um, in actual anticipation of information, I don't, I don't know of any study, but there might be. Okay, thank you for all the questions. Please keep them coming. Okay, so moving on uh, to another um, aspect of active learning, which is detecting when you've made a mistake and possibly adjust learning strategies following an error. There are numerous behavioral studies that investigate infants' knowledge and expectations by exposing them to surprising events, violations of expectations. And um, they repeatedly show that infants allocate more visual attention and direct their exploration towards gaining information about the unexpected events. And investing the neural underpinnings of these learning opportunities that follow unexpected events. Um, Berger et al. Uh, recorded brain activity in six to nine month olds in the classic sort of um, arithmetic task where they showed two objects, occluded them, removed one, and then revealed the outcome, which was either consistent or inconsistent with the previous events. And they recorded increased power of theta oscillations over the frontal central electrodes following surprising events, <clears throat> in addition to already uh, demonstrated looking time differences. Um, in another study using rhythmic visual brain stimulation, in a similar paradigm. So in this case, they had uh, various sort of expectation violating events. Some were physical, like uh, uh, like a ball passing through a wall, some were arith arithmetic like this, and others were um, gestures or actions that ended in, in a surprising way. And in this case, um, these were static images shown to babies at the flickering, rate so they they used um, steady state visually evoked potentials and flickered the images either at theta or at alpha uh, frequency and what they found was a, a response in the occipital theta this time because um, it's a visual um, paradigm and they found an increase in visually entrained theta following the surprising events but no, no increase in entrained alpha. So these studies suggest that uh, theta in response to unexpected events may reflect, again, a learning process, such as updating the representations or models, um, 
or heightened attention or increased interest or cognitive processing um, as part of active learning. Okay, and then, um, well, surprising effects are by definition unexpected. Much of infants' everyday information is in more predictable. And as we already discussed, one of the important sources of information is other people. And um, a lot of developmental theories propose that infants are in fact, especially sensitive to social information. And consistent with that, uh, studies have found increased theta oscillations in social versus non-social stimuli, possibly reflecting um, the heightened attention or information expectation in this rich context of social interactions. Um, and uh, the study that I told you about <clears throat> that we conducted with the informative, non-informative speakers shows selective engagement for the ones that provide information. But in both of these conditions, we also found an increase from baseline in theta. So although there was a larger increase uh, for the informant versus non-informant uh, conditions, both of the conditions actually um, induced theta, suggesting that um, this default expectation of information or cognitive engagement in all social contexts. Okay, then we have some studies on language and entrainment. So um, speech is an inherently rhythmic phenomenon and the rate of syllable production actually universally exhibits three to eight Hertz rhythm. And this rhythm has been shown to be mirrored by phase locked theta oscillations in the brain of the listener. This has also been shown that uh, the primate's lip smacking behavior also exhibits a theta um, rhythm, but in humans specifically, the synchronization or entrainment by which neural oscillations adjust to match the phase of the rhythm of external stimuli has actually been shown to facilitate the parsing of speech into meaningful units that can be then used for decoding. And this process actually enhances the perception and intelligibility of speech. And this kind of uh, cortical tracking has also been shown in seven month old infants and was shown to be facilitated when infants were listening to infant directed as opposed to adult directed speech. So investigating the differences in how well infants neural oscillations track ongoing speech could offer novel insights into characteristics of speech that facilitate or hinder uh, language acquisition or potentially help uh, in case of language delays as well. Um, and yeah, in terms of direct evidence for key time implication of learning, as far as I know, uh, we only have the study we already talked about in the talk. For anyone that wasn't there, we looked at theta during exploration of objects and found that it predicts how well infants recognize the objects at test. And crucially, in this case, um, we checked whether there's activity in any other frequency bands that predicts learning, and it was specific to theta. It was specific to frontal theta and no other scalp location. And importantly, we also had measures of how long infants actually spend both manually manipulating the, the object as well as visually attending to the object. And all of these measures were part of the model looking at uh, which predicts the learning outcome. And it was only theta that came out as a, a significant predictor of whether or not the objects will be recognized at test. And finally, I think one of the exciting questions that should be explored more is the question of individual differences. Um, and we've talked about before with studies in animals that have shown a predictive relationship between hippocampal theta recorded prior to the beginning of a conditioning paradigm and the speed of uh, learning during the paradigms, such that rabbits and rats, whose most prominent um, oscillatory activity in the hippocampus was in theta frequency range, learned faster than those that exhibited higher or lower frequencies. And although, of course, pre-training activity might not be a permanent or a stable individual feature, 
it does suggest a promising line of research um, in how theta relates to other uh, cognitive functions or environmental factors. And in children, there's very limited um, data on this. And um, uh, sort of a mixed bag a bit, a bit. So in some studies with children that were either institutionalized or from low SES showed that um, they had higher levels of baseline theta activity compared to non-institutionalized or high SES. And uh, the author suggested this might reflect some sort of maturational lag. And while uh, the SES study also related the lower resting state theta to better performance on working memory tasks, it remains unclear whether resting state theta, how it compares to theta on cognitive tasks, whether the found differences are stable, whether this measures any predictive power for learning over time. There are two re more recent studies that do address these questions in partly, um, uh, which show that individual changes in theta activity, I think Sam mentioned this before, over a course of repeated video watching predict uh, so how quickly the theta sort of drops off i believe during the repetitive video watching at six months predicts infants nonverbal cognitive abilities at nine months of age and another study shows the degree of change in front of theta during similar video repetitions and its interaction with processing of new information distinguished between infants exhibiting high and low visual seeking behavior as reported by their parents. So I think these are uh, findings are exciting first steps into investigating how neural activity may shape individual differences in learning over time, as well as what factors may affect it. Um, and yeah, in, in a slightly different approach, we also try to look at individual differences in our paradigm of causal learning. Uh, to look at whether sensitivity to compounded information um, suggests um, or ability to recognize learning opportunities relates to whether they can actually make the correct causal inferences. And in the future, we want to relate the neural data to behavioral data on the same task. Um, we've already done that, but trying to split the, the sample based on the performance but we also want to look at maybe um, trial by trial differences, how fast uh, infants learn and whether their neural activity during familiarization predicts how they learn and so on. Um, okay, so now I have sort of more practical stuff on designing TETA experiments. Um, I don't know whether maybe we should take a break or um, what do you think? It's like halfway through. How do you feel? Do you want to take a quick five minute break? Would you? Yeah, well, that's okay. Yeah, well, glued to the screen, so <laughs> take a five minute break. <laughs> okay, so back at yeah five as uh, so a three twenty five. Does that okay. work? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so the last part um, is uh, practical considerations for experimental designs using theta measures. And here in particular, if anyone is planning or has questions about the, their own designs, it would be great to have a discussion. Um, so I just prepared some broad guidelines or um, tips from my experience. Um, okay, so first, with respect to localizations of effects, so both adult and infant or children studies um, report mostly frontal theta activity. Um, in our studies using the 128 channel system, <clears throat> we use either these line electrodes or um, the surrounding ones as well. So this would be like FP1, FP2, FP2. Um, FZ. Um, some also found um, effects slightly more centrally, but the ones that report frontal activity are predominantly in this area and equivalent to other systems, obviously. Um, so this 
frontal effects have been shown in exploration of objects, also re relation to learning, uh, in the changes during video watching that I mentioned before that are predictive of uh, cognitive abilities later on, um, in expectation of information in social contexts, and also uh, endogenous attention and in violation of expectation. Um, other locations that have uh, reported effects in sort of cognitive learning tasks in infants were central um, in the case of some studies with the joint versus solo play and um, theta predicting bouts of attention. Then the, the one using the uh, SSVPs um, reported occipital, but that's because it was in trained vi visual theta. And in our case of the anticipatory theta, in social context, we also found effects in bilateral temporal uh, sites. So there's some indication that um, there was stronger theta in frontal sites for sort of functional data, um, yeah, functional information, as opposed to verbal information being stronger in the temporal sites. But these are not conclusive, it's just uh, sort of descriptive information, but um, it might, there might be um, localization effects um, based on the content of the task. Um, with respect to baseline corrections, so you can also compare theta directly between conditions if they're um, equivalent, but it's always wise to correct for uh, baseline activity. And what's important to know in, in studies looking at any oscillations, in fact, is that um, it's recommended to have two full cycles of the lowest frequency in your range um, to correct for the baseline condition. So theta in infants is approximately three to five hertz, which means that two cycles uh, last about 666 milliseconds, so two thirds of a second. So if you're looking at higher frequencies, that period would be shorter. Um, but for theta, it's recommended that a minimum 600 milliseconds of baseline is included for the correction. <clears throat> it's also good to have baseline immediately before the period of interest. That is a general rule, I believe. Um, and ideally try to avoid any rhythmic activity in either visual or auditory domain. For example, I use this kind of um, inter-stimuli uh, attention getter, which seriously interfered with my theta recording because this elicits a lot of theta. So try to avoid these kind of uh, attention getters or at least have another period where you don't have any rhythmic activity that would in fact elicit theta where you don't want it to be. Um, when to expect an effect, an effect? This very much depends on the paradigm. For example, in our object ex exploration paradigms, there was continuous theta throughout the exploration. So here it was also very strong effect. So you can actually see theta in the raw, <coughs> excuse me, in the raw data. Um, for objects that elicited a lot of theta and not for ones that didn't, obviously. In the anticipation paradigms, uh, we found pretty consistently that theta seemed to build up over the anticipation period. So we consistently used the two second anticipation for practical reasons so they don't get bored and so on. And we generally only found the effects in the second second of the anticipation. Now it's unclear whether this um, is locked to the actual expectation of the onset of the information and whether our, if our anticipation period would be three seconds long, we would see the effect in the third second, or it just takes one second to build up, and so we would see it in second and third. So this is something that um, I haven't systematically looked into, but just to keep in mind that um, it may not be uh, at the entire period that you expect it to be. Um, in the violation of expectation paradigms, the effects seem to be really quick in both studies that I mentioned um, using the SSVPs as well as um, non-entrained data, they report results within the first second 
after the expectation violating event is presented. <clears throat> Uh, with respect to this frequency range, um, this is also a little bit loose. So most studies report effects in three to six hertz for, for infants and four to eight for adults. Um, again, as I said before, this uh, frequency differs between the populations, but is considered to be functionally the same. But the exact frequency range can vary based on age. So if you're studying in uh, 12 month olds or three year olds or adults. Um, and you can either predetermine the, the frequency range based on um, existing literature with your uh, population. Uh, some also take the approach of actually looking at the frequency power spectrum and selecting it from there. So for this, you kind of have to have either a resting state uh, task or something that is non related to your experimental, and you can perhaps identify where the um, sort of the more strongest um, theta frequencies are and select based on that. But this is not very common. Um, this is something also relating to the question we had raised um, earlier number of trials um, that you want to include. Like I said, in the original studies, we had a cutoff of 10 trials per condition within subject. But this, of course, varies based on length of trials in the object exploration, where we had one trial was considered one object, so 40 seconds. We had a minimum of 10 seconds of artifact free data where, while the infant is playing with the object. But it would vary between 10 and 40 seconds, basically. Um, <clears throat> And we would have only the cutoff for inclusion was in fact only four uh, trials or four objects in, for the analysis in the current um, causal reasoning task. Like I said, I have four trials per condition and they're eight seconds long. So um, there are no strict guidelines on this, but like I've also already said, theta is generally a very strong signal. You can even see it while you record. And so much fewer trials are typically needed to find an effect than with, say, ERPs. Um, and then uh, relating to the question raised by Gerd um, with respect to localization and what we can actually conclude from it. Um, while there are, there is quite a lot of consistency within infant studies and also between infant and adult studies, there are no studies yet that I know that it report any intracranial or MG uh, data from infants or relating theta oscillations to any hemodynamic responses. So we don't really know whether these conclusions that can be drawn based on adult and animal research about the effects on the ponergic system and hippocampal activity and memory formation are warranted in infants. We don't have evidence against it, but also no actual data to support um, strong localization um, conclusions. Um, and that's kind of it for me. So most of the stuff that I presented um, is uh, taken from this review paper, opinion paper on theta in infants and active learning, which has also been distributed. So if you want to look up any of the studies, they should all be in there with exception of maybe a few. Um, and yeah, now I very much encourage questions and discussion. Thank you. All right, then we'll go the same way. We'll start off with questions. I think, Raji, now you can turn off the recording so that people feel free to ask questions as they need to.